Okay, another question from a listener, this time at English Dogs. He asks, uh, I'd like you to please to go into the reason slash the evidence for why you predict the end of the current welfare state. So I'm guessing from the name that English Dogs is also uh, an English, is an Englishman. And it, so I'm going to, I'm going to, talk about Britain, but I don't think that this exclusively applies to Britain at all. I think that this is a a universal phenomenon. So the welfare state, I think, is becoming increasingly apparent, is self-limiting in the sense that it generates conditions that make its long-term survival impossible. In particular, it encourages people to have fewer children. So it used to be and still is in some parts of the world, that the your pension was your children, essentially, or maybe other younger relatives. So there was no state pension waiting for you. Many people would not have sufficient savings to live well in old age and pay for servants and so on. For most people, they needed to be cared for by their own children and grandchildren and maybe other younger relatives when they, when they were older and they could no longer work and look after themselves. Bearing in mind, this is also an era where people don't necessarily live into old, old age. Um, life expectancies are much shorter. Although never believe, you know, when you look at life expectancy data, always bear in mind that um, most periods of history have very high infant and child mortality rates. So when you see life expectancy of 35 or something, that doesn't mean everyone dropped dead at 35. That normally means that there's very high infant mortality rates, and but some people live into their 70s. They've always, there are always some people who, who live long lives. But it's also true, though, that most people are not typically expecting in these traditional cultures to live into their 80s or 90s. And also they don't have the medical tech to be keeping people alive who have all sorts of conditions, which now people in their 80s and 90s suffer from. So there's, it's, yeah, so it's not like you're spending 20 years living in a sort of high care setting at home, generally, but you are expecting to, um, to live with your family when you're old and to be cared for by your family when you're old, which, you know, let's be real about it, puts a lot of, puts a lot of burden on particularly um, women in the family who are expected to do both elder care and childcare. So it's not, it's not easy, but that is the traditional model. What the welfare state does, um, you know, thinking of, thinking about Britain, so this is, this is the early 20th, early 20th century when the welfare state comes into existence. It comes into existence, the old age pension was instituted at a time when most people didn't, the life expectancy was lower than the state pension age. So, and, and I think the average, the average number of years that someone who claimed a state pension would claim for was like seven or something. Not very many. Whereas now we're talking 20, 30, right? So 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 lengthening lifespans is one of the things that undermines this system because it just becomes more it has become more and more expensive. But the other more important one is that now people do not have a financial incentive to have children. In fact, the opposite, right? People have to people who have children have to have to pay all of the upfront costs associated with having children out of their own pocket. Some countries have more um, pronatalist policy and, and policies and tax arrangements. In the UK, that's not true. That in the UK, you, the, you, you get child benefit if you earn less than 60k. Child benefit isn't very much. They, the, st the state will pay for health and education, but otherwise, basically, your children are invisible to the state and all of the costs associated with raising them fall on you personally. Most of those costs are the loss of the loss of one person's income or the cost of childcare, which are very high. The stuff that children need, like food and clothes, isn't that expensive. What's expensive is, is, is someone caring for them all the time. So individuals are carrying all the costs of having children, but all of the costs of old age care are socialised. So people who don't have children get as much access to state pension and the health service when they need it, as do people who do have children. There's absolutely no incentive on a financial level to have children, therefore. Obviously, people there are other reasons why people should have children. And I'm also, I'm not saying that a system where people only have children for financial reasons would be a desirable one necessarily. I'm just stating a sort of plain fact here, which is that it used to be that people bore the costs of not having children in old age. People now do not bear the cost of not having children in old age, ex uh, except in terms of um, loneliness. But financially, in, in, in terms of the care they're provided with, it's all exactly the same. 
So the problem that the welfare state cooks up for itself is that it disincentivizes people from having children. You end up with falling birth rates. You end up with an, a, a, a demographic pyramid that doesn't look like a pyramid, that looks like an inverted pyramid, where you have a lot of older people, not enough children, not enough working age people to be providing not just all the tax revenue that needs to pay for care and pensions, but also the actual labor that needs to provide for care and pensions. The only real way out of this, out of the inevitable collapse of the welfare state, where all of the um, entitlements that people have been promised just dwindle and disappear because no one can pay for them, is that we somehow maybe have robots that can provide this care. So that's that's something that the Japanese are pursuing strongly because Japan has chosen, Japan has a, a, an aging society, very low birth rates, and has chosen to have very low levels of immigration. So Japan's efforts in this regard are to try and replace uh, care labor provided by humans with care labor provided by robots. Um, it's surprisingly hard to create robots that can do things even as basic as changing a bed or changing a person's clothes or feeding a person. But, you know, they're trying and it, I guess it's plausible that that might one day become possible or that you might have robots that supplement humans doing care work. Um, I think, though, that that's a, that's a big gamble to assume that that's going to work out. And given that in the UK we're making absolutely zero efforts to invest in any of that stuff with the UK government's decision is just to import enormous numbers of care workers from Asia and Africa along with their dependents. I mean the, the, what the UK government has chosen to do is incredibly short-termist where it imports people to do care labor right now for their voters right now who need who, who need care and want and don't want to pay too much for it but all of these people we're bringing in because we don't have a guest worker system. All these people we're bringing in are going to themselves need care and are, are themselves going to be eligible for pensions and all of this stuff when they reach old age. So it's just creating a problem down the track. And 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 because people who work in social care earn so little, they're not net contributors in terms of the tax they pay. Many of them are going to be living in social housing because they can't afford rents because they're, they're like, these are poor people, right? Like it, it's astonishingly short term as what the government is doing right now. I I therefore think that like my 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 completely honest advice is that it's very likely by the time so I'm now thirty one by the time that I reach state pension age there is going to be no state pension for me. The NHS is going to be a much much more impoverished service than it currently is, and I and everyone else in my generation will likely depend on my children and grandchildren for at least some of my care, um, as has always been the case. You know, people say, people respond to this by saying, what if your children don't like you? What if your children can't or don't want to provide care for you? What if you can't have children for a whole bunch of reasons? Yeah, true, 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 true. However, like the, uh, what other option is there? <laughs> I'm not. I'm not offering a sort of perfect solution. Obviously, there are going to be exceptions, yada yada. But I think is. I think that we should assume that we are eventually, whether or not it's within the next fifty years, we are eventually likely to return to the system of old age care that we have relied on for all of human history up until about a hundred years ago. That is, we expect younger relatives to. Um, look after older relatives and sadly people who don't have younger relatives to look after them are at risk of um, destitution so that is that is a very serious practical consideration in deciding whether or not to have children people it's very easy to look at the current setup and where you have to pay up front for all of the costs involved with having children and think that it's not financially in your best interest to have children if you know, if this were the 1970s, I would agree with you. And 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 if you know you you knew how things were going to progress, I would agree with you. Some people who didn't have children um, during the latter half of the 20th century lucked out, at least financially, in the sense that they didn't have to incur the costs for themselves, but they still got to benefit from the welfare state as they got older. I think that's extremely unlikely to be the case for my generation and younger. Mm -hmm.